I just want to get, uh, and I know you've been talking about this in a kind of more broad sense, but what do you see as the three top threats that uh, U.S. Cyber Command or the NSA have to uh, plan or defend against top three? And it can be a country or it can be an issue. But when, you, when you're going to bed at night, what are the top three that you're... So broadly, as I look out, um, number one is just the day-to-day -day defense of the Doden. Um, I look at DOD. We are a massive department with a global laydown and a network infrastructure that was built in a different time in a different place in which redundancy, resiliency, and defensibility were not core design characteristics. And so my challenge at the Cyber Command side is I got to defend an imperfect infrastructure and give us the time to make the investments to build something better. So that's challenge number one. I'm always thinking to myself, what are the vulnerabilities out there that I don't recognize yet that someone's exploiting? Number two would probably be I worry about most penetrations in networks to date have largely been about extracting information, extracting, pulling the data, whether it's to generate intelligence insights, whether it's to um, generate battlefield insights, whether it's to potentially attempt to manipulate outcomes. What happens when it's no longer just about data extraction, but it's about data manipulation, and now data integrity becomes called into question? As a military commander, if I can't believe the tactical picture that I am seeing, that I'm using to make decisions that are designed to drive down risk and help me achieve the mission, if what I'm seeing is a false representation, and in fact the choices I'm making are increasing the risk, and in fact are not having positive outcomes, Data integrity, data manipulation really concerns me. That, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And then the third one, probably, what happens when non-state actors decide that the internet is not just a form to coordinate, to raise money, to spread ideology, but instead offers the opportunity to act as a weapon system, to employ capability on a global scale? So let me, let me ask about that last one, because I think one of the things that we continually hear in terms of our cyber strategy and how it and how that this domain differs in so many other domains is that um, the attacks when they occur on us seem to come in some cases without much cost so we're getting hit from all different angles and we're not sure where or how and you can't do a symmetrical mm -hmm. smackdown maybe but how do we how do we raise the costs for adversaries who are attacking us in this domain, or how do we signal that we're going to do it? Obviously, a lot of it, if we're signaling, we have to have credibility. But how do we raise the cost? Do you think we do need to raise the cost? Do you think in this domain that uh, our adversaries or potential adversaries think that they can take action and kind of get away with it because we're not going to respond? Do we need to be more aggressive in signaling how we're going to respond and then, and then respond? I mean, I think we need to show adversary we have capability, we have intent, and we have the will to employ it uh, within a legal framework. Have we done that, though? Much? We have, as I've said, we've done it. The Sony piece, I would argue, you could also argue um, in the areas of hostilities, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, we're doing some good things every day that clearly I think the opponent understands that we're applying this capability against them. We've publicly acknowledged that we are doing that. I think in part that idea of publicly acknowledging the fact that we were using cyber as a capability to counter ISIL was not just to signal ISIL, but was also to make sure others are aware that the Department of Defense is investing in these capabilities. We are prepared to employ them within a legal lawful framework. Do you think we're sending that signal to state actors in the cyberspace? Uh, I, I certainly hope so, sir. Well, do you think we are? I don't know what. I think it. it you're, the, you're in charge, right? right? So it, hope makes me a little worried. What it, do you it think? varies by the actor. Honestly, it varies by the actor. Do the Iranians fear that we could retaliate against them if they take some kind of cyber action? Yes, my sense is the Iranians have a sense for capability. And I apologize, I can't get into a lot of specifics. But my sense is they have awareness of capability and they've seen us use it. Let me ask this one final question. It seems to me kind of longer term, one of the biggest strategic advantages we have in this domain is our youth and their capabilities, which far exceed probably everybody in this room, uh, given how smart they are in this space and how they've just naturally grown up with it. What are we doing to make sure to try to recruit younger Americans to, you know, be on the right side of the issue, to come serve their country in a really critical area where they, in many ways, have unique 
skill sets that a lot of us, no offense to my colleagues around the dais here, that a lot of us don't have. Yes, sir. Uh, on the NSA sale, I'll just highlight a couple examples. We have a conscious effort uh, that we've been doing for several years now. We do uh, high school and junior high school cyber camps that we partner with a variety of institutions across the United States. We have cyber acquisition or cyber academic excellence and academic research excellence relationships with over 200 universities on the NSA side across the United States because we realize much of the workforce that we're looking to gain in the future is going to come from these pools. Yeah. And so there's something to be gained, we believe, by interacting early with them and more broadly for the nation as a whole, helping to encourage the acquisition of these skills, this knowledge, in a way that just wasn't necessarily the case in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.